Hello everyone, this is the Add and Made Simple with Ms. Rodriguez, and today we're going over everything you need to know about the atom for high school chemistry. Today we're going to be going over four things, and that is atom history, the parts of an atom, Bohr models, and average atomic mass. Starting with some facts about the atom. An atom is the smallest unit of an element that retains the properties of that element. An atom is the basic building blocks of matter, meaning that all objects, substances, and materials are going to be made of atoms. An atom is made of three subatomic particles, and those are protons, neutrons, and electrons. The proton is going to be positively charged. Neutrons have no charge, meaning that they are neutral, and electrons are negatively charged. The proton and neutron can be found in the nucleus, which is at the center of your atom, and that's where most of the mass of the atom is going to come from. The electrons belong in the electron cloud, and they have very negligible mass, but the majority of the volume of the atom is going to come from that electron cloud, meaning that the majority of the volume of an atom is actually going to be empty space. A little bit of atom history. So starting from the beginning, we have Democritus around 440 BC. He proposed that everything in the world was made up of tiny particles. He called these particles atomos, which is Greek for indivisible, meaning they can't be divided. And he also proposed that atoms are surrounded by empty space. Now at this point in time, they didn't really believe him. In fact, they ridiculed him for his beliefs. And so the next big development for atoms didn't happen until 1808 with John Dalton. He revised Democritus's atomic theory, and he actually came up with our definition of atoms. But he also gave us the theory for compounds, which is that they always broke down into the same elements in the same proportions. Then in 1897, we've got our first model, which is from J.J. Thompson, and he did the cathode ray tube experiment. And through that experiment, he discovered the electron, and he created the plum pudding or the chocolate chip model, which looks something like this, where you have a positively charged medium and a bunch of free floating negatively charged electrons. In 1908, Ernest Rutherford added to the model. He's considered the father of the nuclear age because he's the one who discovered our nucleus. He shot positively charged particles as sheets of gold foil and through that gold foil experiment, he proved that atoms consisted largely of empty space and that most of the mass is in that positively charged nucleus. And now we have Niels Bohr in 1913, and he determined that electrons orbit the nucleus at fixed energies and distances. He also discovered that electrons can jump from one level to another, and that's what we have today, the Bohr model. Now, there is a more advanced quantum model that is the currently accepted model for the atom, where you have the electron cloud, but we don't really go that deep into it in chemistry. So how do atoms relate to elements? Elements are only going to contain one type of atom. That's what makes it an element. Which element it is can be found by looking at the number of protons in your atom. So if the number of protons change, the element changes. Elements can all be found on the periodic table. Below is the tile of chlorine from the periodic table. And just by looking at that single tile, you can find out a lot of information about that element. That top number is the atomic number, which is equal to the number of protons which is also equal to the number of electrons, assuming you have a neutrally charged atom. The chemical symbol is just abbreviations for elements on the periodic table. So for chlorine, it's going to be Cl, and each element is going to have a unique chemical symbol. The bottom number is the atomic mass, which is equal to the number of protons plus the number of neutrons. Now, how do we go from an element tile to this Bohr model? If we look at that top number, so this is another way to see an element tile. This is one for sulfur. Sulfur has an atomic number of 16. That means in our Bohr model, we should have 16 protons, so 16 P in the middle, and 16 electrons, so 16 red dots in our electron orbitals. 
32 tells us protons plus neutrons. So to figure out neutrons, we have to subtract. So 32 minus 16 protons give us 16 neutrons. So 16 neutrons in our nucleus. Now step by step, this is how we draw our Bohr model. First, you draw your nucleus. And inside the nucleus, you can either draw the number of protons and neutrons that you need, or you can just write. So 16P, 16N means 16 protons, 16 neutrons. Then you draw your electron shells. The number of shells is going to depend on how many electrons the element has. And lastly, you're going to draw dots to represent your electrons. And it does matter where the electrons are placed. In your first energy level, which is the level closest to your nucleus, it can hold a maximum of two. So two electrons and make sure you put them near each other. In the second energy level, it can hold a maximum of eight electrons. So eight electrons. And when you draw your electrons, it's top, right, bottom, left. Then you go back around and you give them a partner. So that's 10 electrons so far. We need six more in order to complete this Bohr model for sulfur. The third energy level can hold a maximum of 18, but we only need to draw six more to complete our Bohr model. So again, starting from the top. One electron, two electrons, three, four, five, six. And notice that the bottom electron and the left electron are left without partners. And that's how you draw a Bohr model for sulfur. Now for our last topic. Before we get to average atomic mass, I want you to think of apples for a second. Do all apples have the same mass? If they have different masses, are they still apples? Of course they are, right? This is also true for elements. Even though they have different atomic masses, all three of these Bohr models still depict an atom of carbon. Because it's carbon, they're all going to have six protons. That's what makes it carbon. The thing that changes is their number of neutrons. This is what you call an isotope. Isotopes are forms of the same atom that differ only in their number of neutrons. That means that isotopes are going to have the same atomic number meaning same number of protons, but different atomic masses. So even though their protons are the same, their neutron changes. For example, the Bohr model to the left is carbon-11 because it has five neutrons. The middle carbon is carbon-12. It has six neutrons. And the right Bohr model is carbon-13. It has seven neutrons. So all still depicting carbon, same number of protons, same number of electrons, just different number of neutrons. Isotope notation is fairly simple. It just takes the information you know and flips where the atomic number and atomic mass are. So you put your chemical symbol, so in this case it's carbon, you put the mass number at the top and the atomic number at the bottom. So if you ever see this format, don't freak out. It's just isotope notation. If the atomic number is the same, but your charge is different, then that means you have an ion. An ion is an atom with a net electric charge due to the loss or gain of electrons. So again, we don't change the protons. If you change the proton, you change the element. Ions are going to have the same atomic number, but different number of electrons. And as a result, you get a charge. For example, in this left Bohr model, we have six protons, six neutrons, but only five electrons pictured. So plus six minus five gives us a positive one charge. If we have six protons, six neutrons, and six electrons, that is a neutral atom because positive protons plus six, negative electrons minus six give us a zero charge. If we have more electrons than protons, so in this case we have six protons, and seven electrons, you end up with a negative charge because protons are positive, plus six, and electrons are negative, minus seven. Plus six, minus seven, give us a negative one charge. 
If you have an ion, the isotope notation changes a little bit. If it's a neutral isotope, you leave the space blank. If it has a charge, then you put the charge on the top right. And just by looking at that isotope notation, I know everything I need to know about the subatomic particles for that carbon. So for example, on this left one, I know that it has six protons, six neutrons, and six electrons while the carbon on the right has six protons, six neutrons, and eight electrons. Remember that minus two means there are two extra electrons. There is a difference between the atomic mass you see on the periodic table versus the atomic mass of a sample. So the atomic mass of the periodic table, if you notice, there are decimals. That means it's an average. It's the average of all naturally occurring isotopes for each element. So their weighted abundance of the isotopes that are on Earth. When you look at a particular sample, we're only trying to calculate the average for the isotopes of that element in that particular sample. So don't always assume that the average atomic mass that the problem is asking for is the same as the one on the periodic table. I've had a lot of students make that mistake. So how exactly do you calculate average atomic mass? First off, what even is abundance? Abundance is how much of each isotope is present in the sample. There is a formula for average atomic mass. It's average equals M1P1 plus M2P2 plus however many isotopes you have. M stands for atomic mass and P stands for percent abundance. So let's go back to apples for a second. Let's say you have three apples with a mass of 100 grams and one apple with a mass of 200 grams. So 75% 100 grams, 25% 200 grams. What's the average mass for these apples? Let's look at our formula and let's plug in the numbers that we know. So the average equals 100 grams times 75%, so times 0.75 plus 200 grams times 25%, so 0.25. That's 75 plus 50, add them together, and you get an average mass of 125 grams. That's how we find the average atomic mass for an isotope as well. Given the information about IR that we're given in this chart, this is how we would have calculated the average atomic mass. So first you take the atomic mass, so atomic mass of the first isotope, the 190, multiplied by its percent abundance. Don't forget to turn that percent into a decimal. So move your decimal two times. Take the mass of your second isotope, so that's the 192.9, times its percent abundance. So move your decimal twice, times 0.627, and you get your numbers. All you have to do is add them together. And there's your average atomic mass for these two isotopes. So 192.2160 AMU. And that is everything you need to know about atoms. Thank you so much for your time. Let me know if you have any questions in the comments below. If you like this video, make sure to like and subscribe so you don't miss any more of my chemistry content. I do have this exact PowerPoint as well as worksheets, labs and activities for this unit in my TPT store called Chemistry Made Simple, which I will link below. I hope you guys have a good day. Bye!